Full Circle is brought to you by Goods Candy Shop. We are just better. We're goods. I'm Suzanne McAllister. I'm glad you could be with us today. Coming up in this half hour, we'll meet Autumn Latendry. She is a passionate advocate for military families. She's going to perform in our musical segment a song called Yellow Ribbon. But first, we're going to talk about a man who also had a love of country. He is from Vincennes, Indiana. He's known as the Sentimental Clown. And if you guessed Red Skelton, then you're right. We're going to talk about Red Skelton. Here to give us some helpful information about a fantastic museum in Vincennes, Indiana, is Dr. Phil Summers. Dr. Summers is the chair of the Red Skelton Museum Foundation, and he's also the former president of Vincennes University. It is wonderful to have you here, Dr. Summers. Well, thank you for the invitation, and it's uh, also wonderful to share stories about Red Skelton. Well, we are surrounded by Red Skelton memorabilia, so what a perfect uh, atmosphere to be able to talk about him. Certainly, I remember him because his shows played until 1971, and I have such vivid memories of making our family laugh and, and tuning into his shows. But, but let's go back to the beginning. He is from Vincennes, Indiana. He was born in Vincennes in 1913. Uh, it's an interesting story that he was a poor child, his father died two months before he was born. He was the last of four children, three older brothers. Uh, his mother lost their home, lost their family business, which was a little grocery store. His father ran that grocery store and was also a clown in a, in a traveling circus in the summertime. But the family uh, had to move in with relatives. She took in cleaning and, I mean, she cleaned houses, took in washing, trying to keep her family together. Maybe moved to Indianapolis for a short period of time and then moved back to Vincennes. And he grew up there and all of the brothers had to work. And Red started uh, his work at about eight or nine years of age selling newspapers on the streets in Vincennes. Well, you mentioned that his dad was a clown. We have a picture here right next to you. Tell me about the significance of that. Well, he uh, has, there are many stories about his interest in clowning, but he started out, uh, I guess, with Ed Wynn, uh, t inviting him to come to a show that was playing there in Vincennes at the Pantheon Theater. They had traveling road shows, and Ed Fent Wynn was, uh, according to Red Skelton, was the feature. And this man bought all of his newspapers, said that he would uh, give him a ticket to the show. And when he arrived, he realized that the man was a featured person, Ed Wynn. Ed Wynn took him backstage, held him up, let him look through the curtain, and he said he fell in love with the audience, and he wanted to be a clown, and wanted to be a comedian, and Edwin's advice to him was, make people laugh. And that's what Red Skelton did for about 70-some, 80-some years, is to make people laugh. Well, and you mentioned that he fell in love with the audience, and the audience certainly fell in love with him and all the characters that he had. We have this uh, wonderful uh, costume here that will be at the museum in uh, Vincennes, Indiana. Tell me about the costume and why that is such an important piece in your collection. Well, it probably is his most famous character, Freddy the Freeloader. And uh, it maybe came out of his background of being poor and not having a lot of things, but he always uh, played Freddy as a lovable person and that someone who was always gracious to others and acted with dignity even though he didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> and so he uh, wore this costume 
Uh, this costume uh, was, he used on television was specially made for him. Uh, it was uh, valued about $40,000 in our collection. And he always carried with him props. Yes. And you're holding one that he uh, really had fun with. Yes, so tell me about the significance of this, because I remember him always sweeping things off. He, before he would sit down in any place, he would take his brush out of his pocket and he would brush it off again to show this dignity without money. Yes, yes. He also carried some other things with him. Sure, let's him. look. This was uh, uh, the fun thing. He carried... Looks like a cigar butt. A cigar butt. <laughs> and uh, he would always be picking them up, or showing how poor he was, etc. And he'd keep them in a tin in his pocket. And that was sort of his expression of wealth. He'd pull out his uh, cigar butts. And then he had his own heater that he took with him. Oh, right. And this was just a glass filled with matches. And uh, <laughs> whenever he got cold, he would play, play with those. Um, I did not bring the hat with me, but the hat was a very important part. Uh, Red Skelton liked to use the hat for props. He'd turn it upside down. He would make different, he'd become different characters when you'd use hats. But he liked, this was his favorite costume. And we also uh, have a picture, I think, somewhere, of he and uh, Lucille Ball uh, dressed alike in those outfits. Um, he would invite characters, people to his show, and then they would share some of his uh, fun things with his characters. But if you remember, he really started in radio with the voices. And many people, like myself, would sit home on Sunday night and listen to the Red Skelton Hour and hear all these characters with the voices. And then when he transitioned to television, then he just had to personify those voices with costumes and the character look. So Color Fire McPug, the mean little kid, the senator, all of those people were uh, uh, became part of his show. And I understand that it was the first color program on CBS. So he not only was a pioneer in his own uh, art, but in the art of television. We need to take a short break, but when we come back, Dr. Summers mentioned that Red Skelton got his uh, uh, part of his start in radio. We're going to show you this huge record after this. Stay with us. We're continuing our conversation about Red Skelton with our guest today, Dr. Phil Summers. We left off by talking about Red's career in radio, and I'm holding this huge disc. What's the significance of this? Well, this was uh, put out by the Treasury Department during World War II, and it was for the bond sales that they were having all over America to raise money for the war effort. And Red Skelton is featured on this, and he traveled all over the United States helping sell bonds. Uh, he was very popular in radio, uh, before that, vaudeville, theater. Uh, in those days, they would show a movie and then they would have entertainment in between. And he was a featured actor in so many theaters here and in Canada. So uh, this uh, is an important part of his creative self. He was not only an entertainer, as we know, on television for 20 years, he made 38 uh, films, movies, where he was a featured actor and comedian. And he also painted, he composed music, it goes on and on. And this is part of the legacy of Red Skelton. Yes, and you mentioned that he painted. We referred to the clown picture earlier. He actually painted that and then also was instrumental in the big coloring book that we have as well. But uh, Dr. Summers, I want to uh, jump in on that notion. You said that he was very creative. He was also known as the sentimental clown. Um, Red Skelton had a breakdown when he was in the Army. Uh, speak to that a little bit. He had, um, when he went into the Army, they put him in the entertainment section and he entertained. They would uh, wake him in the middle of the night when troops would come in and say, you've got to go do a show. He was doing five or six shows a day and it was just really draining on him because in vaudeville you could do the one act and you could travel from town to town to town. There, if the men had seen it once, he had to come up with new material. He had to do uh, what uh, most of us could not do, and that's be, be creative every time he stepped before an audience. And that was a, a, a dream because he wanted to serve his country so well. Sure. Well, he was also a very sentimental person. This is personal letters to Georgia. Tell me about this. Well, the story that he told, uh, I, I attended a meeting, a breakfast meeting, where he was telling, talking about his life. He said every morning he would get up at 5.30 in the morning. First thing he would do would be to write a love letter to his wife. Then he would do a sketch. 
Then he would do something maybe he might use on his TV show. He would compose some music. He would do all these creative things. Then on Sunday, he would take the very best thing and develop more fully. But the letters <clears throat> were very special. Uh, all of his, his two children had red hair. His wife had red hair. He had red hair. He called her Little Red. She called him Big Red. And all of these, what you're showing now, were the, the letters that were bound and he kept. And in our collection, we have numerous volumes of this because every day he would write her a letter. Well, that's a little hint to you guys out there to start writing. Um, he was a patriot also, and we well, talked about his... his love of America was just uh, outstanding. And one of the things that he did in 1969 on his TV show at the very end, and this was when America was having a very difficult time. There were uh, riots going on in America, et cetera, and he uh, said to his producer that he wanted to do the Pledge of Allegiance, and a very special one that he had learned when he was a student in Vincennes, Indiana, in school. And the, the producer said, that's not comedy. We shouldn't be doing that. And uh, he did not get a lot of response, positive response, but he did it. And shortly after that he did it, the CBS studio telephone system went down because of all the calls that they received from wow. people. He yeah. recorded that, and it has become uh, really a national institution now. Read into the congressional record twice, and we get emails every day at the museum asking for copies of that. And yesterday I got an email, and a man was circulating a copy, and he wanted five million hits on that email. Well, we are going to take a minute and actually hear Red Skelton doing that very special Pledge of Allegiance. If I may, may I recite it and try to explain to you the meaning of each word. I, me, an individual, a committee of one, pledge, dedicate all of my worldly goods to give without self-pity, allegiance, my love and my devotion to the flag, our standard, O oh glory, a symbol of freedom, wherever she waves, there's respect because your loyalty has given her a dignity that shouts freedom is everybody's job. We're talking about Red Skelton on today's program with our guest, Dr. Phil Summers. And uh, maybe you didn't realize, but Red Skelton was inducted in the International Hall of Fame for Clowns. So Dr. Summers, I understand that there's an interesting story about Red and Clowns. Well, the, the story goes, I think, uh, uh, captures the spirit of his life. And that was that in his contracts, when he was appearing, he did not want people to say that he had won four Emmys or he had been uh, given all of these different accolades by different organizations. There was only one sentence that they were to do to introduce him, and that was, ladies and gentlemen, Red Skelton, Ameri one of America's clowns. Oh, that's wonderful. That because really speaks to his. Humble. Yes, I was going to say that speaks to his rural roots in Vincennes, Indiana, and the fact that he really was a humble, humble man. And he wanted, he loved the Hoosier State. Any chance he got, he came back and he entertained here at the Indiana State Fair at Ball State's homecoming, at uh, Indiana University's homecoming. He just felt uh, strongly that pull to be a, a Hoosier. Now, Dr. Summers, and, I'm sure lots of people are going to be rushing down and wanting to see this museum, but this is all about building up to the museum. Tell correct. me about the Performing Arts Center and your vision and plans for when the museum we, opens. We have a $20 million Performing Arts Center on the campus of Vincennes University. And when I was chairman of the board in 1997, when Red Skelton died, I asked the board to name a theater, the Red Skelton Theater. Uh, we had no plans, we had no approval from the Higher Education Commission, we had no money. Well, it took us 10 years to go through that process, and we had a performing arts center. And then we said the next step has to be to save the legacy of this great entertainer who also was a patriot, was an artist. He did so many different things, and he cared for people. 
He gave money. Uh, his family were very concerned because he was very generous with people. He carried a lot of cash with him because when he was poor, he didn't have anything. And people would ask him for money, and he would hand, hand that out readily. Well, in our museum, which we hope to open in a year or so, we're going to tell the story of a young boy who was raised on the riverside of Vincennes, who was very poor, who became an international star, and was beloved by millions of people here in Canada and Europe. Uh, all the, the people that knew Red Skelton felt something special because he was a comedian that you could trust that he was not going to embarrass you or your family with the humor that he used. And tell me how he signed off all of his shows because I think this is very special as well. He would go out uh, at the very end of the show. In fact, he would say, he, in the interview with me, when, when he was talking to me, he said the only time he was really Red Skelton was in the last few minutes when he came out at the end of his show. And that's when he started with an apology. He hoped that he hadn't offended anybody, that he wanted his humor to be family-oriented. And then, of course, he always signed off with God bless. Uh, that, again, speaks to the man. Okay, what I would like to know, we, you're going to have this big museum, you have the Performing Arts Center, you have his name everywhere, you have all of his costumes. What do you think Red would think about all of this attention? <laughs> well, there, we, we had a statue cast that we put in the foyer of the Performing Arts Center, and it faces the theater entrance in the foyer. <clears throat> and his widow, Mrs. Lothian Skelton, was there and saw it, and he's smiling, holding a cigar, looking that direction, and she said, this is perfect. He is smiling, looking at the theater. He said he always wanted to have a theater in his honor so the next generation would have the opportunity that he had to perform and know the love of an audience and entertaining. And isn't that part of your vision so that you can spread that joy of, of humor? That humor and the type of humor where you can be creative and entertain, but deal, do it in a way that the whole family can appreciate it. We want to tell that story. We want to tell the story of patriotism and community service. We want to talk about the history of radio and television so that the young people today don't think that it just came out of the box. <clears throat> All that that was developed by generations of people in Red Skelton was at the very beginning. So we have a lot of things, and also that story of being <clears throat> poor doesn't keep you from being a success. Well, that's a fabulous way to end our program about Red Skelton. I'd like to thank Dr. Phil Summers. He is the chair of the Red Skelton Museum Foundation in Vincennes, Indiana, and the former president of Vincennes University. Thank you so much for this helpful information. And I would like to present you. Oh. Oh, with thank a hat you. From the museum. Well, I'm going to put this hat on because you know when I'm at home, that's what I'm usually wearing <laughs> is my hat. <laughs> thank you. Well, don't go away. We're back with Autumn Latendra and Yellow Ribbon after this. Stay tuned. Musical Showcase is coming up next. And now, here's our musical showcase. Joining me now is Autumn Latendry. She has been honored by First Lady Michelle Obama as a gold star wife. She has been reaching out to military families and helping them through difficult times because Autumn knows how difficult it is to lose her husband. He, Brian died in Iraq in 2006. First of all, thank you for the ultimate sacrifice of, of your husband. Uh, his service is, is so honored by all of us, so thank you so much. Thank you. I, I would like for you to tell me about the song Yellow Ribbon that you are going to perform today. Yellow Ribbon is a song written for all of the troops, past and present, um, honoring their deployment and then welcoming them home. And we don't ever want to forget that they are away. So here is our song. All right, and joining Autumn today, we have an Indianapolis singer, Frank Bradford, to join us. So Frank, Autumn, thank you for joining us. I'll see you next time, Full Circle. We moved here in 99 to start a family. Planted an oak tree As life went on it grew And so have we 
Don't you? 